Okay. Good morning. Greetings to you in the name of the Lord. It's great to see you on this dual Sunday. It's Christ the King Sunday, which is to say the last Sunday of the church year. Next year, uh, next week is a new year. Uh, please don't stay up until midnight next Saturday celebrating. Um, you can do that another time, but uh, next next Sunday is uh, the first Sunday in Advent, and that's the first Sunday of the Christian year. This is also uh, Thanksgiving Sunday, and this week is going to have a lot uh, of Thanksgiving <laughs> to it, uh, so, uh, more for some than others, I, I suspect, uh, but... Um, uh, thank you for, for joining us, and if you would please fill out the attendance register and uh, pass that along to others. Uh, and uh, greetings, too, to those of you who are joining us via the internet. We're glad to have you uh, that way, but we would love to see you here uh, as well. While you're doing that, uh, a few things to mention. First, a uh, reminder to the session, we've changed our our meeting time on Sunday. So remember, we start at five rather than 5.30 uh, this evening. And uh, then we proceed through the week. And I think the simplest thing is to just ask John if you would, would uh, come up. This is, this is the big week. Uh, and everybody, everybody needs to, to be involved if possible, so. Well, every week's a big week, right? Um, but in our church family, this has been a ministry that we've been doing for, I can't tell you how many years exactly, but I can remember when the preparation was in the basement kitchen and we've been over at the junior high and their kitchen and finally in our beautiful Main Street Center. Um, the board back there, we've asked everybody to have their stuff here by today. Um, my Sunday school class has, has indulged me to, uh, to chase things down this morning and inventory things. And so the last minute buying things, we're gonna, we're gonna scour Cape and Cape County for uh, what's left of what we need. Um, and if you, I think everything else is here. I've talked to a couple of you this morning about a few things on the board that were signed up for that you're gonna wait to bring and that's fine as long as I know they're coming. Um, all the dressing prep items, the onions and celery, we need to have them today. We need to have them no later than five o'clock because Brad and our youth are going to uh, prep those for the dressing folks on Tuesday. So we need those today. Uh, and that's really the main thing we need today. Tuesday morning, uh, Dwayne has talked to you, you know, the, uh, about the turkeys and the turkey prep. Uh, I know you ladies that I know some of you basically come out there to the Kiwanis building to do that. And then you double duty, come back over here and start prepping the dressing. And then you triple duty and go back out there and we pan everything up and get it ready for Thursday. Um, so those groups, Glenda's not here today, but she's got her, her team ready and waiting. Dwayne's got his team ready and waiting. And Thursday morning, we hit the ground running. Well, I'll be here before, but we start at six. If you've got some time available to, to serve in one of the prep area, prep times, either the six or eight o'clock shift, uh, or the helping with the serving, or especially delivery, we always press at the end for delivery folks. So if you, if you feel on your heart to come do that, um, oh, I forgot uh, Wednesday is roll day. So we, we prep and, and bake all the rolls that day. And then we turn around and move all the stuff into its proper position Wednesday evening. Bill's helped me for a couple of years doing that. He's great help with that. So other than that, pray. We need your prayers, prayers for health, prayers for me to uh, not be too uh, not nice to people. So when I get stressed, my family and my close friends will tell you that I can be that way. So and I apologize in advance. Sorry, Lord. But hopefully with your prayers and, you know, just giving it to him, we'll get through it again. So thanks. 
Thank you, John. <clears throat> the more folks we have, the less John will get stressed. And there will be much rejoicing. <laughs> Uh, looking ahead a little bit uh, into December, we have a couple of things uh, happening. On December 5th, uh, there's going to be a bazaar of uh, Christmas gifts and other stuff that will be <clears throat> for sale in the Old Fellowship Hall. Immediately following worship, the, uh, the missions ministry team is doing that and uh, Oh, they uh, still can uh, receive uh, homemade, handmade items. And if you would like to contribute those, please speak to Brad. And uh, even if you're not contributing to that uh, with, with something made, uh, you can, of course, can contribute by purchasing because all of the proceeds of that will be going to missions. So um, keep that in mind. That is... That's just, that's two weeks from today. That doesn't seem possible somehow. Um, my goodness. Uh, the, the other thing I, I should particularly mention is, um, is uh, that on December 24th, I know it's a long way to, in, in advance, but I just want you to know, December 24th, we will be having a Christmas Eve service. We didn't last year. Um, and I know a lot of people missed it. So uh, put that down. We will be doing that this year uh, as, as we have in <clears throat> so many years past. Um, two other things uh, real quickly that I want to mention. One is uh, thank you to those of you who turned out yesterday to uh, salute uh, Norman Hickam on his 100th birthday. Uh, my goodness. It was, it was quite an event. And you might want to take a look at uh, WPSD. Is that it? PSD? Uh, what? Did they really? Oh, I didn't even know they were there. Uh, so yeah, this, was, this is a big deal. This was a big deal. Um, so thank you for those of you who were, who were there. The other is uh, on Tuesday, Marianne and I took our gifts for Operation Christmas Child down to Vienna, and she has a, a word about that. So this is how it's going to go. There's going to be a volunteer, and the volunteer is going to hand the child a box. The child's going to open the box, and they're going to say, wow, there's a book bag and it's full of stuff. There's a calculator in here and art supplies and school supplies and all kinds of neat stuff is in here. And another child's gonna open a box and he's gonna say, I got a soccer ball and an air pump and a whole bunch of other neat stuff in here. And a little girl's gonna open a box and she's gonna say, Oh, I got a sweet baby doll, and she's even got a little bottle, and I can feed her. And there's all kind of other nice things in here. Why did a stranger give me this? And the volunteer that handed her the box is going to say, because they love you. And the child is going to say, why would a stranger love me? And the volunteer is going to say, because Jesus loves them. And the child's gonna say, who is Jesus? See what you started? And how many times did you start it? Now I was worried about this. We got supply chain problems. We got inflation problems. We got money problems. We got chaos in the world. And I thought, if we get anywhere near the 62 boxes we did last year, I will be thrilled. And it was looking pretty thin two weeks ago. I don't mind telling you. Well, we had a little help from Trinity Pentecostal Church, which is our new secretary's church. And they had a few boxes they wanted to give, so they combined them with our boxes. Well, then we were up to a certain number of boxes. And then somebody called me the day we delivered the boxes and said, we didn't get our boxes delivered. Can we deliver them on our own? And I said, yes. Guess how many boxes we had? 
62 boxes. So 62 children are going to ask that question, who is Jesus? This old Sunday school teacher's heart is about busting with pride at you people. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. My Christmas is so joyful this year because of you all. Thank you very much. And I think <clears throat> that will do it. Let's worship the Lord. I taught them how to do that. <laughs> that was awesome. That was awesome. Uh, stand with me, if you will, for the call to worship this morning. Call to worship is from Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is he 
Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do come to give thanks. We do come to give you praise. God, we do come because you are good. And God, that your love does endure forever. God, it, we come to worship you. We come to praise you. We come to just lift your name that you may be honored and glorified in all things. God, today as we sing your praises, may we sing them to you. Father, as we hear your word, may we take it to heart. May we not just hear it, but be doers of the word. And we ask that in Christ's name. Amen. As was mentioned in the call to worship, to come into his presence with singing, that's what we're going to do right now. Our opening hymn is number 570, We Gather Together. Please join with me as we go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you so much uh, that we can gather together this morning. Uh, we thank you for this church. We thank you for the leaders. We thank you for the faithful uh, saints who have preserved this church for so many years now and took their faithfulness to you, God, and the fact that we get to enjoy these two talents. Father, we, uh, this week, we have so much to be thankful for. Um, we thank you for uh, Miss Barb and Pat uh, for their healing from their recent surgeries. Um, we are so thankful for Norman and uh, the celebration that we got to have with him and his family. Uh, Lord, just thank you for what a blessing he has been to this church, to our community. Um, thank you for his service to our country, Lord. Uh, Father, just we pray that you be with him. Um, Know that we love him and we miss seeing him here every week, Lord. Father, we do um, have so many people that are on our hearts, uh, those that are sick, going through things, um, mental health issues, Lord. Father, we just lay all those at your feet um, as we all have people on our minds that we're thinking about right now, Lord. Um, we lift them up to you and we thank you, um, God, that you were in control and that you were the great healer. Lord, we lift up um, Nikki Nance's uh, brother and sister-in-law, Bill and Carol, Lord, just be with them, be with their um, doctors, um, and as they don't have family nearby, God, uh, just I pray peace with them and um, that you would just 
Give them comfort during this time, Lord. Father, we thank you for this week as our nation um, tries to celebrate gratitude in <laughs> uniquely American ways, Lord. Father, we, I pray that you give us each a heart uh, for Thanksgiving this week, that we would be thankful for what you do in our lives every day, God, not just this week. Thank you for this church. Thank you for our elders, Pastor David. Lord, thank you for um, the faithful every day in our congregation that are loving our community um, quietly in your name, Lord. We thank you, God, uh, that you are in control. Whatever we see around us in this world, Lord, you are bigger than all of it. Father, now we come to you and we um, say the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Gratitude is not just about this week, of course. It's a weekly, it's a daily occurrence. And today, uh, this, this week, perhaps above others, but uh, in line very much with others, we come to say thank you to the Lord who has so blessed us. We do so through the presentation of our tithes and offerings. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power the universe display then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to how great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God his son not sparing sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art when christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home 
white joy shall fill my heart then i shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim my god how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art thank you chloe let's pray father we thank you for the good gifts that you have given to your children and as we come with these gifts, we ask your blessing upon those who give them, upon their stewardship and their faithfulness. And we ask your blessing upon the gifts themselves and the ministry that they represent, the ministry of all of us that they represent, and ask that you would use them to bring your word, your truth, your love to Anna, Southern Illinois, and even to the ends of the earth, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Old Testament lesson for today is from Job 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There was born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When the days of the feast had run its course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts, Thus Job did continually. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered to the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to him, have you considered my servant Job? that there is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him that is his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Please stand as you're able and join us for our second hymn, number 565, Come, Ye Thankful People, Come. Come, ye thankful people, come, raise the 
reading from the gospel according to Luke, chapter 17, verses 11 to 19. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered a village, a man met by him from Bethany, who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. As they went, they were silent. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Back in the... uh, in the mid 1980s, uh, you know, before the 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 uh, invention of flight, uh, or some a long time ago, uh, I was serving a uh, Methodist church in Pittsburgh, North Carolina, um, about ten miles south of Chapel Hill, the uh, home of the University of North Carolina, and uh, that was a small church. Uh, average attendance was about 35, uh, membership was about 90. And, uh, and yet I look back fine, fondly on that church, at least in part, because of one of my favorite parishioners, a man, man named Lamont Norwood. Uh, Lamont was, uh, was a storyteller. Um, he once 
told me that he had read Francis Asbury's uh, diary, Asbury being the, the first uh, bishop of the Methodist Church in America, and that Asbury had come to where Mount Pleasant was, uh, northern Chatham County. And, um, and uh, Asbury wrote in his diary that the people of Chatham County were some of the most ignorant people he had ever met. <laughs> Lamont was really proud of that. I'm not sure why exactly, but, but he must have told me that story a half a dozen times in the years we were there. Well, he also had some great stories to tell about his time during World War II. He had been in the Navy. Uh, he had been at Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. He was serving as a medical representative on a minesweeper that helped save men aboard the sinking battleship USS California. He served at Midway, and he served in the Solomon Islands, site of the Battle of Guadalcanal. The interesting thing to me is that despite having lived and served through some of the, the darkest moments of the war, and having been faced with possible death on at least three occasions, he always said that he was thankful thankful to God for having gone through that experience. Once when I asked him why he was thankful for having been threatened with death, uh, he said that it was not the threat that he was thankful for. It was the fact that God had been with him through all of it. And when he told me that, he sounded just for a moment like Job. Job was a great and wealthy man uh, who lived in the land of Uz, not Oz, but Uz, the place where we would get the pretzels from. Wait a minute. No, that's Uz. I'm sorry. That's different. Anyway, the land of Uz, uh, a, a land somewhere to the east of the Jordan River, uh, generally thought to be somewhat southeast of Jerusalem. In all likelihood, he was a Gentile. We're not given any, any reason to think otherwise, but one who nonetheless knew the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was the possessor of large land holdings, would have had to be, given the livestock that he, uh, that he owned. We're told that he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 5,000 each of ox and donkeys, uh, as well as a large number of human servants. For those days, Job was incredibly rich. Uh, it, it, would, it would not be a large exaggeration to say that, uh, that for his day, uh, Job was, uh, was the equivalent of a, of a Bill Gates or, or a Jeff Bezos. But he was rich not just in material possessions. Uh, he also was the patriarch of a big family. And if anything, that was even more important. He had 10 children, including seven sons. Now, I specifically mentioned the sons because the people of those days believed that sons were a sign of God's blessing. Uh, as the daughter, father of one daughter, I might take issue with that, but that was the way people thought. They did not think that daughters were a curse, mind you, I should be clear about that. But sons were a special blessing because they were the ones who were going to carry on the, uh, the family name and traditions. Well, even more than wealth, Job, uh, is admired by the author of the book that's about him because despite the fact that he was not an Israelite, he still knew the Lord. Not only that, but he obeyed the Lord and he feared him, feared him in the biblical sense of having respect and awe for the majesty of his creator. High praise is lavished upon Job in chapter one, verse eight. God is recorded as saying to Satan that Job is a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Now, does that mean that Job therefore was sinless? No, of course not. We know that only one person in the history of humanity was sinless and that was Jesus Christ. But he lived a life 
which any uh, Israelite would have been proud of. Uh, he was even concerned about his children's contact, uh, conduct, uh, not, not because he was worried that, the, that they might disobey him. We're not given any, any sense of that. Uh, and they're adults, okay? They're, we're not talking about, about little kids. Uh, he wasn't worried about the way that it might reflect upon him as a prominent man, but he was afraid that they might, however intentionally, offend the Lord. And so in verse five, we're told that he sacrificed on their behalf on a daily basis, just in case they have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Something he would not have seen, but wanted to deal with anyway. So when you put all of this together, it's not surprising that the author of this book would say in verse three that Job was the greatest of all the people of the East, all the people of those to the East of the Jordan River. But his greatness and his faith was about to be put to the test. The test came about when Satan, whose name means accuser, accuser. Satan came before God. And the Lord asked him uh, whether he was acquainted with Job, a man unlike any other on earth. And Satan, assuming that Job was just like other, any other people, replied that the only reason that Job loved and feared God was because of what God had done for him. Okay. He loved God and he feared God because God had blessed him with this, these enormous herds and with all of these children and with a loving home. And he feared God only because that might be taken away. The tempter said that if Job was deprived of these things, Job would curse God to his face. And that might well have been a fairly reasonable assumption with most people. There are a lot of people, and we've all probably known some, who after some kind of loss, whether a really big one, such as the loss of a, of a spouse or a child, or after, uh, after losing a job or, or a home, uh, has, has said to God, you obviously hate me and, and, and are cursing me, so I will have nothing more to do with you. We've, we've heard of folks like that. Okay, um, but uh, God knew Job better than that. And so he told Satan that everything that Job had was in Satan's hands. He could do as he wished with this man. The one thing was that he had to spare Job's life. Now, the evil one, no doubt, was delighted at the opportunity and he set about his task with a vengeance without knowing anything about the conversation uh, that had taken place in, uh, in places that he didn't see, Job then suddenly found himself stricken with a series of dire calamities, any one of which uh, might, might well have, have destroyed the faith of, of another man. First, thieves came around and they stole his ox and his donkeys along with the servants who were with them of whom only one survived to tell him the bad news. Then nature attacked him in a lightning storm that killed all of his sheep along with their shepherds. And again, only one survived in order to tell him the bad news. The final blow to the man of riches was the theft of his camels and their tenders, and that left him that left him broke, as people in those days uh, counted such things. He he was he was now destitute. He had he had nothing, uh, nothing but his house and his family. And despite that, we hear no complaint from him. But Satan wasn't through with him. Having destroyed his material possessions, Satan now decided to hit even closer to home. In verse 18, we read of the most terrible message Job had yet 
received. Your sons and daughters were eating in their older, oldest brother's house, and behold, a great wind, perhaps a, a tornado, uh, struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead. In a moment, his entire posterity wiped out all of his children. You need to understand this wasn't just a tragedy in terms of loss of life or loss of loved ones. Yes, that's, that's the case also, obviously. But for the people of Job's day, children and especially boys were, were a person's most important asset. They assured that you would, in a sense, go on living after your time on earth was done. Posterity was really important. Is really important. It's important to us now, uh, but it was it was everything to to a man like Job. Now here was the news that his posterity was gone in an instant. What else could possibly befall them? We might say. Well, unfortunately, the devil still had a couple of plagues left. In chapter two, we read of the first in verse seven. He struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Uh, we don't know for certain what it was that's being described here, but uh, at least one commentator has said that uh, having asked physicians' assistant, uh, phys uh, doctors' opinions about it, uh, what he heard over and over from them was given the region and given the description, most likely he was afflicted with elephantiasis, what many people might think of as the elephant man's disease. Uh, a, a worse illness in terms of the physical and emotional pain that it causes, uh, as well as the revulsion that it, that it provokes in people who, who meet those who suffer from that disease is hard to imagine. And then, then in the midst of his grief and his loss and his pain came perhaps the worst plague to assail Job yet, his wife. Oh, she looked at him sitting in agony on an ash heap and asked, do you still hold fast your integrity? She couldn't believe that he was still holding on to his faith. And she had an answer for him too: curse God and die. Oh, goodness. <clears throat> Gentlemen, you think your wives are difficult. All right, I have nothing more to say. <laughs> you think your wives are difficult? Imagine this. Get over it, Job. Why continue to suffer? Why live with torment? Curse God and accept the consequences. They can't be any worse than what you're dealing with right now. I'm sure that when he heard that, Job must have wished that the people who stole his camels had taken his wife instead. Uh, I mean, camels might smell bad, but at least they can't talk, right? Well, Job's response to this is nothing short of amazing to those of us who are used to complaining about any little thing that irritates us. You've heard, you've heard the expression, I'm sure, uh, first world problems. Uh, to describe the way that some people complain about the most trivial of stuff. <laughs> this is not a first world problem we're looking at. When he heard that all his property was gone and that his children have all been killed, he tore his robe and he shaved his head, which in those days were both signs of grief. And he fell to the ground and he worshiped God and said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's astounding. After all that had happened to him, that was extraordinary. 
he blesses the Lord because even in the midst of pain and loss, he recognizes that it's only by the grace of God that he had anything in the first place. He came into the world with nothing and, and he, he was blessed with, with these vast herds and, and with this, this wonderful family and this wife. And, uh, and, and if he left with nothing, it would be exactly the same way as he'd come into the world. Uh, I, I saw a story once about uh, the English novelist Somerset Maugham. If you've ever heard or heard of or read the, the book or seen the movie uh, Of Human Bondage, uh, Maugham was the author. Well, he, he, uh, he kept a cracked earthen cup on the mantel in his, uh, in his home in London, which was not a pauper's home by any means. It was a, it was a very nice place. And he was asked once why he kept uh, such an ugly thing so prominently displayed among a variety of, of beautiful works of art and, and the like uh, in his home. And he explained that during World War I, on a troop ship crossing, crossing the ocean, our rations of water were reduced to just one cup a day. I drank my ration of water from that cup and I keep it on the mantle as a reminder that I can never take my blessings for granted. A cracked cup reminding him that even a cup of water was a blessing not to be taken for granted. Well, Job didn't take his blessings for granted either. He knew what the grace of God was about, having experienced it firsthand. And he knew that he had done nothing to earn that grace. I and mean, that's what grace is, right? Unearned, unmerited favor. So he could bless the Lord even in the midst of adversity. And he could also tell his wife when she urged him to end his misery by repudiating God, his response to her was, shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? Better translated as trouble. Okay, so let me, let me give that again. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive trouble? He didn't know that the trouble hadn't come from God. Rather, it had come from Satan with God's permission, but it didn't matter. It didn't matter. He was of the same mind as Martin Luther, who once said that if it was God's will that he should be condemned to hell, then he would praise the Lord for his goodness, even, even from the pit. And Job is of the same mind. It's true that over the course of the next 30 plus chapters of, uh, of the book of Job, uh, Job repeatedly questions uh, why am I in this situation? How could this have happened? And you'll remember that he engages in dialogue with several friends, uh, most of whom uh, basically say, well, you must have brought this on yourself somehow. That was very comforting. And one of whom says, ah, who knows? And in the end, well, Job receives an answer, but the point is that even through all those 30 some chapters, he never takes his wife's advice. He never curses God. He never, even in the midst of his questioning, he never curses God. In fact, in chapter 19, he rises to one of the great affirmations of faith in all of the Old Testament and he says, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that the one who shall save me out of this situation is alive and at work. Now, we might ask, what's all this got to do with Thanksgiving? Truth is, I think that Job is a perfect example of what the Apostle Paul urged all of the disciples of Christ when he wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. That's not an easy thing to hear. It is really hard 
to give thanks in some of the situations that we find ourselves in. Uh, we discover that a spouse has cancer or a son is killed while serving in the military or our employer lays us off or one of our children is arrested for drug possession. We can think of a hundred, we can think of a thousand different things, terrible circumstances in which we would not want to give thanks. And yet that is what the Lord calls upon us to do. How is that even possible? Well, it's possible for several reasons. First, we have to realize that we owe God everything, everything, including our own lives. Truer words were never spoken than when Job said, naked I came from my, my mother's womb and naked I shall return. All that we have, our family, our friends, our relationships, our material blessings, our freedom, our faith, salvation, life itself, everything we have only because God in his goodness has given it to us. The, uh, the old American standby of, of saying that, that I'm a self-made man who pulled himself up by his own bootstraps in order to become successful in life, Job would have, would have heard that and, and shaken his head and said, you have got to be kidding. There is no such thing as a self-made man, which is not to in any way denigrate hard work and effort. It's to say instead that, that everything that, that, that comes to us because of that comes to us because of what God has given to us. At the same time, does that mean that God promises us a rose garden? No, there are times when, when, uh, when, the people and the things that he has brought into our lives uh, are going to cause us disappointment simply because our expectations and God's plans don't always mesh. You've, uh, you've perhaps heard the, uh, the story of the little boy who came to the dinner table one night and after examining what was on the table, uh, his parents asked him to say grace and his response was to offer this prayer. Lord, I don't like the looks of it, but I thank you for it and I'll eat it anyway. Amen. I, 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 did, I, did, that, I did that when I was growing up. Every time corned beef was put in front of me, uh, it, it, it made me want to retch. It still, to this day, it does. I can't stand the smell, the smell of it, but I'd eat it anyway because... That's what was in front of me. Well, we don't always get what we want for dinner. And though we wish it were not so, bad things sometimes do happen to God's people. That's why Paul tells us to give thanks in all circumstances rather than for all circumstances. We don't thank God for cancer or for unemployment or for drug addiction. In fact, we thank God despite these things in the same way that, that Job did. Job didn't thank God. Oh, thank Lord, my herds have been destroyed and stolen. Uh, my children have been killed. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? No, he didn't, he didn't give thanks for those things. His praise of God, his blessing of God was despite those things, but still very real. Well, we can thank God in all circumstances for a second reason, and for that, we need to turn to the eighth chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter uh, verse 28. Uh, he writes, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Some people read that as a promise that, uh, we are going to have a life of sweetness and light into which no darkness, uh, no bad stuff will, will ever fall. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no such luck. No such luck. The world that we, with a little help from the tempter, have made uh, is a pretty messed up place. Now, the, the, word, the word from the Lord that Paul 
passes along is that even in the worst of times, God can and will bring good about. Uh, you've perhaps heard that, uh, heard the idea, and we don't know if this is true, but it may well be, that out of the, Holocaust, the horror of the Holocaust, God brought the Jewish people to a homeland in which they could defend themselves and live securely. Great good coming out of great evil. Uh, a, a more specific example from about, about that, yeah, close to the same time, uh, comes from Corey Ten Boom's book, uh, the hiding place. Uh, she tells this. She tells of the time in that book, right after she and her sister Betsy uh, had been transferred to the Ravensbrück concentration camp, which was a camp specifically for for women. And uh, Betsy, after reading First Thessalonians five eighteen, had told Corey that they needed to give thanks for every detail of their new living quarters. And Corey, at first, looking around the barracks, uh, refused to give thanks for the fleas. You can understand that, right? She refused to give thanks for the fleas. Uh, she, there was a lot more that she could have refused to give thanks for, but that was one thing in particular that, that, that bothered her. But her, her sister persisted, and finally she gave in, and she thanked God for the fleas. Well, months passed, and they were amazed at how openly they could uh, hold Bible studies and prayer meetings without the guards interfering. Normally, that, that kind of activity, uh, they, they'd be right there in their face, threatening uh, them with all kinds of punishments for doing what they weren't supposed to be doing. Well, they later found out that uh, the reason the guards wouldn't enter the barracks was because of the fleas. Did that make the fleas any less irritating for those who had to live with them? No, of course not. But it did help them to realize that the Lord can make good come out of even, even the bleakest situation. Well, finally, we can give thanks in all circumstances because in the end, God's love triumphs over everything that would stand in his way. At the end of the story, at the end of Job, after all the pain and the grief and all the struggling with God that his, uh, that his suffering led him to, Job refused, of course, to take his wife's advice. And in the end, God reversed the effects of Satan's cruelty and he restored his blessings to Job. But for us, God's triumph over evil may not take such a tangibly earthly form. For us, more likely, uh, the model is to be found in the cross and resurrection of Christ. Despite suffering the folly of evil and of sinful men, despite the, the pain of crucifixion, despite the agony of rejection by his people, in the end, Christ showed us the way to our ultimate triumph by being used, uh, by being raised to new life. This is the good news. This is the good news for which we may be joyfully thankful this morning and every day of our lives that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Gracious Father, for all your blessings, for all your goodness, for all your generosity toward us, we give you thanks and praise. Our brother Job said that he knew that his Redeemer lived, and as we bask in the love of that Redeemer, we proclaim our faith that he is alive and working in every situa situation and every person in our lives. Strengthen that faith, we pray, that every moment of our lives may be full of praise and gratitude toward you. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Please stand as you're able for our closing hymn, number 564, Now Thank We All Our God. receive this benediction from the Lord. May the God of all grace, who has called us into his family and blessed us richly and sent us into the world to spread the gospel and to give thanks to him, go with us and be at work in us and be seen through us both now and forever. Amen. Amen.